everyone, I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and this is the 300th episode of Dye Pop Weekly. I cannot believe that we are here. And to celebrate, I thought that it was appropriate to take another deep dive into glazing yarn. Glazing, a technique I do extraordinarily well by accident, and yet I really struggle to achieve this effect, this shallow layer of color on the yarn intentionally when I want it to be there. And so I thought today that we would set up some different conditions to try to maximize the glaze that we can see on a few different yarn bases, hoping that at the very least I learn more in the process. To get a thin layer of color on yarn, to get that yarn to strike really just on the very outside of the yarn, you want the dye to strike to the yarn really, really fast. But if you want that to happen all over the yarn, you also want that to happen a little bit slow. And so the balance here is something that I've struggled with for sure. But it does seem that leaving the yarn in the pot for a long period of time does help with a more even coverage. And if the acid is high enough, then the color will strike to the outside of the yarn. So this is sort of the starting point for where we're gonna jump off from today. And then we'll tweak some of the other variables to see what makes a difference. Before we jump in, please make sure you're subscribed to the Chemnitz Tutorials YouTube channel, turn on your notifications, and while you're at it, give this video a thumbs up. But now, let's go look at the yarn we're gonna dye today. Today, we are going to play around with multiple different yarn bases, uh, specifically some that are high twist, like Knit Picks Bear Twill and Muse, both of which are 100% superwash merino. Muse is an Aran weight, uh, just single ply yarn, and so therefore it glazes really beautifully, as shown in this image of some yarn that my five-year-old dyed. <laughs> that video will be coming out later on. Superwash Merino Twist is a three-ply heavy worsted weight yarn, which also is high twist and should glaze really well. Swish DK and Stroll are both loftier. So their plies are smaller, uh, they don't have quite as much twist, and so there's less resist in there. But I figure we'll start on these, and then we'll go over to our Stroll and our Swish DK to see what we can get. Swish is also 100% Superwash Merino, and Stroll is 75% Superwash Merino, 25% Nylon. There may be some other yarn bases that we pull in, but I figured these are four that I will most likely play with. <laughs> We might end up going to dry yarn as we play with this technique, but I did go ahead and start pre-soaking some yarn in just plain tap water with no acid uh, for at least 30 minutes so it's nice and saturated. In my 12 quart stainless steel dye pot, I have 24 cups of water and we're gonna add a cup of white vinegar. This is a lot more than I usually add. One cup is about 240 milliliters, and so this is pretty close to the proportions of liquid that I had during the summer mini skein mini series where I was dip dyeing yarn into true black and purple pop, and we did see a type of glaze on all of the different yarn bases, including Wool to Dye Forest Platinum Sock, which is very, very similar to Stroll. The dye pot is still cold, and I'm going to add one tablespoon of a 2% stock solution of Derma True Black, which would be about 0.3 grams of dye total, and give that a nice stir so the dye is well distributed. And now drawing from what Ryder did when we were using food coloring, but still, I'm going to add some yarn into the pot, move it a little bit, and then stop. The pot is still cool, and now I'm going to turn on the heat. Now the yarn that I added to the pot was one skein of Muse and one skein of Stroll. I thought about just doing the Muse on its own, but I did want to add in 
uh, some yarn that had less twist just for comparison. And so now we're gonna bring this up to heat and see what we end up with. I don't know if this combination of high acid, no heat, will give that glazed effect, but I have seen this from some Leave No Dye Behinds, or then again with Ryder starting cold with this food coloring, and moving it while things were cool maybe means that we can distribute the yarn through the dye, but things aren't striking very fast yet because there's no heat. So I don't know. We'll see what we see. Certainly after this, the dye bath will be hot, and so we'll be able to continue with that, but I just want to try things that have a little bit more variation than what I tried when I would just take the yarn and dunk it in the pot for a brief period of time. I think that by moving the yarn in the pot so much, that meant that the colors were able to like penetrate deeper into the yarn. And so the cases where I really don't touch it very much seem to be where I get some of the best glaze. Although with dip dyeing, I did seem to get a decent glaze and that was moving in and out of the pot. So I don't know for sure, but we will see what happens. One other key component I think is having a larger volume of water. This allows the yarn to sort of be more distributed <laughs> in the pot, which can again let the color be distributed around the entire skein a little bit more. Uh, so we want, we're like aiming for slow down the axis of the dye to the yarn a little bit, but when it hits the yarn, let it strike fast. We'll see. Oh, and the reason why we're starting with white yarn right now is so that way the focus can really be on this glaze, this layer of color we're getting on top of it versus focusing on like how much of the previous color we see through. It has been, I would say 30 to 45 minutes and I have not moved the yarn at all. Once it got hot is when it sort of came up to the surface. Now I would say our muse here looks glazed. Uh, it's really steamy, but the I can see that the color application is shallow. I can see it's just to the outside. Uh, and that's what I expected. And you know, we might see some of that on the stroll. Yeah, I see some elements of that on the stroll as well, where the dye application looks really, really shallow. And it also looks like all the color has absorbed. Now, one thing to I guess consider and keep in mind is that I think the overall proportions of dye, like if you have more dye, it's gonna take longer to absorb and therefore things can be uh, slower. Uh, or things can be slower, which means the dye can penetrate further. So I don't know, but we're gonna try something with it hot. Uh, the dye bath is now hot. We will reuse the same dye bath. So I'm gonna remove this and set it aside because it's definitely been on the heat for a decent length of time. This time I am using a freshly made 1% stock solution of True Black, and we are gonna add a quarter cup of it here into the pot. This is just twice as much dye as we had last time, because last time we were using a 2% stock solution, so right now we have about 0.6 grams of dye in here, and I'm gonna come in with the same two yarn bases. Okay, we've got our stroll and our muse, and what I'm gonna do is I'm dipping them in, not really stirring with the tongs, but I'm dipping them in, and now I'm gonna leave it. And we're gonna let this sit again for about 30 minutes, and I'm not gonna touch it anymore. I have a feeling that because there's more dye, we will see more color penetration, but, I'm curious if we will see some visible difference between this and the first one. But I do wonder if one of the mistakes I was making originally was not letting the yarn be in the pot long enough. Because even when there's not very much color left, somehow putting it in the pot and just letting things sit seems to help a bit, I think. So we'll come back in about 30 minutes. It has been 30 minutes and I do see what looks like glazing to me, certainly on the muse and maybe even to the extent that you 
see it? It does look fairly shallow, maybe, on the stroll as well. I'm going to go ahead and leave it in the pot a tiny bit longer, but the Muse, and we'll, once things are less steamy, we'll compare it all. The Muse definitely seems to have it. So I'm just going to leave this in the pot for a little longer, then we'll remove it and do a third attempt with these two bases and black. Our heat here is still on low. And I am going to remove the yarn. Ooh, hot. Um, so we definitely have uneven color coverage. We've got a tonal for sure, even if we see some glazing to it. And part of that is because it's hot, things overall are striking a little faster. But again, we'll take a closer look once things are no longer steamy. Once again, we have a hot dye bath, and I am going to add a quarter cup of our 1% stock of True Black. So the same amount of dye that we had last time. And I do want to come and stir things up here in the pan. And we are now gonna add dry yarn. And I'm gonna use my tongs to help me add the yarn here into the pot. Uh, now we might see less even color coverage from what we've seen in the past, just because uh, the yarn was dry to start with. And actually, I suppose the yarn might technically soak up um, a little bit more of the liquid as it soaks in, but now I'm gonna leave this to sit for at least 30 minutes. I'll turn up the heat a little bit and we'll see what we get this time. Now I have no real way of knowing that this third scenario will be different than the other two. I think at this stage, my hypothesis is that we may see similar things from each of the three attempts. But the main difference from what I'm doing now versus some of the past videos is that I'm adding the yarn and just letting it sit in there to soak up the color slowly versus trying to just do a very quick dip and really trying to limit the access of the dye to the yarn. Because I think it must have been another video where I feel like the yarn mop, it's like, this feels more glazed than everything else. Why? <laughs> so I'm trying to like, okay, if I'm putting these in to just soak up the color, let's see if we notice any extreme differences from starting wet versus starting dry. Of course, there are other variables that we could play around with for sure. But I think one of the biggest differences when it comes to getting something that feels like a really nice glaze, where you feel like, oh my gosh, this is really only hitting like unevenly just to the outside, I think that it really does depend on the yarn base that you're picking. So even though there are more variables that we could explore here, I think I'm not going to explore other ones today. I think that I will leave it here and then based on what I think of these three examples, I'll use that to go and play with glazing. Um, I've also mixed up some dark navy, so I have that on hand and we'll just play. This is our dry yarn that we added in and then I have really not touched. And, ooh, so I think that I do see a bit of what feels like glazing, but actually the color does feel and I'll compare it to the other one, it feels a little bit more even overall. I think that as we start adding dry yarn in and it quickly soaks in some of that liquid, it's also soaking in that dye more towards the center, where if the yarn has been pre-soaked and has some water sort of in that center already, it's, it's not acting as much like a sponge to bring in that liquid, so. That is very interesting, but I'm gonna go set this aside to cool for a little bit, so then we can look at the three cases together. While we wait for that not to be steamy, let's do a mystery color. 
Uh, in this jar, there is some of that black dye that I've been collecting along the way, and a little bit of navy. And also, here is some electric violet that I have rinsed off of my fingertips from another video. So we're very much in like a leave no dye behind territory here, but using the same dye pot we have been using all along. Which granted, the water volume has gone down over time, but I'm coming in with a skein of this twill and putting it in, dipped it in, and now we're gonna let it sit. And we'll see what that color does, and then maybe we'll do another layer and add more color or something, but we'll just sort of see what happens here. And I'm gonna let this sit with some heat on for about 30 minutes. And then we'll check back. Someone recently asked me if you can have a dark color and then glaze it with a lighter color. And the reason why that might be really, really hard to do or see is that dyes are additive. So if we start with a deep gray base and then try to glaze it with say peach blush or frozen, both of which are colors that can strike really, really fast, you won't necessarily see that color on top of the black. So even though there might be a glaze, you might not see it because there's not a way to lighten color. Like if you add, say, like white acrylic paint on top of a black base, you can probably still see that white. It's not going to blend because the dyes don't aren't opaque when they go onto the yarn. Okay, I think we've soaked up a lot of this color. Uh, I don't know uh, there's definitely like a particulate in here, so that's why I'm sort of seeing if that comes off. This does feel glazed to me though. Uh, and this is a skein that, uh, there's not a lot of color in it at all. But I think that adding it and not moving it, we've got some really, really shallow color on here. But we'll look at that more when it is dry. I think I will leave this one here. Um, instead of adding more color to it. I feel like this video is also going to be a really good example of how a technique that works well for one person may not work as well for someone else. But right here we have one, two, and three. One where we started cold with pre-soaked yarn and less dye. Then we went to more dye starting warm, but the yarn was still pre-soaked. And then finally, the same conditions as here, except the yarn was dry. And the dry yarn gave the worst glazed effects by far. I mean, even looking here, the color there looks surprisingly even. I did potentially move the yarn more in the pot. That is a variable, a variable I am not controlling for very, very well. So I want to acknowledge that. But looking at our first yarn, we have deep color here that has just been applied to the surface. This is that perfect glazed effect that I love. The only, actually it is pretty deep, it is pretty dark on a lighter base here on the Muse. On the stroll, it still feels like it could be a little glazed. There are some areas where I feel that deep color as a layer, but there's also more areas where it really does feel like that color did sink into the yarn. And so sometimes when I've tried doing a glaze, I felt like, okay, maybe I added some color, but not quite enough. I need to add more. So that's another reason why I increase the amount of dye when going to the second scenario. And here, I think that the colors are way off right now, but I think that we still have something that feels very glazed to me. Potentially, eh, I would say the amount of color underneath is the same. If I take the strand that looks a little deep and I untwist it a bit, you can see how uneven that color is and it's very much just on the surface. The stroll has some elements to it that definitely feel glazed to me. I think that Seeing this with another color underneath it, like a pink, might be a little bit easier to see, like when we did the purple pop and black mixed together. Uh, but I would say that there's elements of it, but I think that, again, the yarn base makes a huge difference. Finally, here is our final yarn, which does still have some elements that do feel like they're glazed, 
but overall it feels less like a layer of color. I don't know. It The differences are subtle. I just feel like you starting with the wet yarn, the effect. I look at it and I go, ooh, that's a glazed yarn. And I look at this and I think, ooh, this is a tonal. Those differences are really, really subtle. Uh, so, I mean, I do feel like we've got some light color here on the stroll in our third example. All of this is to say, I think starting cold is actually a really good way to do this. Granted, we had less color here. I think that the one with the most contrast is actually starting cold. Uh, we have a dark color on the outer layer, but you can tell that the under layer is still light. I do wish I felt like this was coming through better on camera, but it just feels like that color penetration is so incredibly shallow. So, so, so shallow. And that is awesome. So picking the right yarn base, if you want, like that color from, I think that first one is on the Muse is exactly what I really, really want to see. So I think that doing this side by side with the stroll has been really, really helpful for me to figure out, okay, how can I try to get this effect? Maybe on purpose. So man, I think, again, the yarn base makes a really, really big difference. And I think all of this yarn is beautiful. It's all gray, beautiful yarn. The big problem with a cold approach to the technique is that it's harder to reset and then do another version and do another version. So that's something that's definitely worth keeping in mind as we plan more for this. So now I think that even though I think that starting cold gave some of the best results, we will do a dedicated video dyeing some yarn and then with a cold bath start the glaze. So we'll do that uh, in the future. But today let's make a mixture that I know will break and see if we get that glazed effect that I saw from the Summer Mini Skein mini series. Even though we're not mixing quite the exact same color, but close. The heat is now off, but the dye bath is definitely still steamy. I do want to add more volume. So that's eight cups and then another eight cups. I actually really wonder if the volume changes uh, over the course could have had an effect as well. Although the color in the last one is pretty even, so I don't know. And now I'm gonna add another, not quite whole, but almost a whole cup of vinegar to just redo that acid. And I would call it not hot. It's definitely a warm bath though, even with adding that cool water. To our dye bath, I am gonna add, we'll, we'll see if I have it. I have just shy of a third of a cup of hot fuchsia. I may rinse out the bottle and add that last little bit to here. And then I'm coming in with a third of a cup or about 80 milliliters of a 1% stock solution of dark navy. Now the color we have in here is very purpley, um, but we might see some breaking. I actually don't know. <laughs> I don't know if this will work. All right, now I want to come in with 300 grams of yarn. The yarn has been pre-soaked. I'm sort of going to dip it in and move things open a little bit to dip in just a little bit of a wiggle. And now I'm gonna turn the heat back on and we will see what happens. Now, my hypothesis is we could have a navy glaze with a pink center because the navy should strike faster than those pinks, but who knows, we might not actually see that. We do in here have one skein of Muse, which is that single ply high twist. We have one skein of the Twill, which is has multiple plies, but it's high twist. And then we have one skein of Swish DK. So in this circumstance, all of the yarn is 100% superwash merino wool. And we'll come back, I guess, in like 30 minutes and see what happens. So again, this 
Last example may not be the best example of glazing, but I do think that there is a really, really good shot that we could see a nice glaze. Because again, with that summer mini skein mini series video, and when I dip dyed into a black and purple pop mixture again, some at the very end, there is this glaze feel with that residual dye that is left in there. And so that's really interesting to me and something that I'm trying to see if I can do on purpose. It might not work. We might not get it. We might just get a really pretty purple yarn, but we could get something where we feel like we're seeing more of that navy on the outside and more of a purpley pink towards the center. I also think that I'm extra hard on myself when it comes to having a layer of color on top of another color of yarn, whether that was white to start or some kind of variegated yarn I created. And it's a layer that may feel light and more like that cool glaze or just might be a layer of color. I can be a little bit harsh. And so I think that you can call I mean, I, I don't even know if I'm using the word correctly. And so if you can just call a glaze, like, okay, I'm gonna add just a little bit of black or a little bit of navy, which really isn't gonna have black on top. It would be more of a gray, but doing that as a layer of color to overall tone things down. And by doing it as a second layer versus having it mixed in, it can give you a different amount of coverage and you can see different amounts of the gray over some of the other color. So that is something that is fun and encouraging and so maybe I should call it like layering versus glazing I don't know <laughs> I just know that I really really love the effect on a single ply yarn where the color just really seems to be sitting on the outside I think that that looks so cool so cool and uh, I mean I do feel like I know more now than I did maybe when we like started at the beginning. But I also know that these videos can go long. <laughs> they can feel long. And so that is something else to, to think about. So I don't know if all these little tweaks are helpful, but what I do hope is helpful is that when you want have an effect that you want to achieve, the best way to get closer to doing that on purpose is just to try, to play and try and try out different techniques, which I am playing with full skeins of yarn today. You don't have to play with full skeins of yarn. You can play around with all these different techniques using mini skeins and small, small volumes of yarn. So then you can have 100 grams of yarn stretch for more experiments and projects as you play around with techniques. I do think that it could be worthwhile getting a scale so you know how much yarn you're dealing with. So then you can have a proportion of dye to yarn when you go and try to scale up on more, more fiber. But it is also worth mentioning that some techniques are easier to do on mini skeins and then it's a little, the technique isn't exactly the same when you have a lot more fiber because you have to make sure you move things more so that way that dye can access the fibers in the same way. But overall, in the earliest Chemnitz dyeing videos, I was dyeing three to five grams of yarn so I could have that skein last as long as I possibly could. And that helped me figure some things out that I really, really liked. And then eventually I started dyeing full skeins and well, now I dye a lot of yarn. So while I am encouraging you to play and make mistakes and see what works best with your tap water and your yarn and your dyes, uh, I do also want to acknowledge that you don't have to play around and do these tests on like a kilogram of yarn at a time, which I haven't quite, yeah, I've probably used about a kilogram of yarn in this video. so. I just, I want all that to be out there. So hopefully that this can be helpful. But ultimately, this is what Dye Pot Weekly is all about. This whole series is a journey of my exploration of color and yarn. And some episodes are very much more of a tutorial. I have a goal and I know how to achieve it. But other ones are definitely more experimental <laughs> where I have something I want to do. What's the best way to do that? Let's try a bunch of different things and see what I think works best. And I mean, I think some of this is my chemistry background showing through. 
<laughs> but I really want to thank you all for joining me on this journey. And if you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe to the Chemnitz Tutorials YouTube channel. I do publish at least two new videos every week, including all summer and all holiday seasons. And we really have a lot of fun. But if there is a technique that you are looking for in particular, go and look at the playlists on the channel. I do have playlists for say cotton or synthetic yarns and I have a playlist for speckles and Kool-Aid. And so I know there's a lot of videos here and so that can be a way to help you narrow down what you're looking for. But anyway, let's go see what's happening in our dye pot. <laughs> it's been closer to 35 minutes I think. And I have to say the whole no touching thing is a struggle for me. But I absolutely see like a glazed effect over on that twill. And let's see, we still have a lot of pink left. I'm curious if, ooh, there's definitely some like, a big navy patch. Ooh, that's hot, a big navy patch over there. Um, there's no question I think in all of them that I see some glazing type effects. I am now going to turn off the heat here and let things cool off in the pot. I'm not sure if you noticed, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of pink in there. And that color is gonna just need time to absorb. But I'm not sure if you can see through the steam and the water, but there's definitely glazing there. And this is just a really, really fun way because I know this pink pigment takes time. So I knew it could be a one pot attempt at getting a glazed color over another color. Anyway, I'm gonna let this cool completely. This colorway is unbelievable. I mean, it's believable because it exists, but this type of breaking really does, it feels like, and this is the swish, it feels like that we dyed this in pink and then layered on the blue. It is so, amazing. Certainly I think the glaze is a little more dramatic on our higher twist yarn, but uh, let's go wash it. I will say it took forever for the pot to cool, but most of the color did absorb to our yarn. To the best of my ability, I am attempting to keep our first, second, and third attempts to glaze this yarn separate to the best of my ability, through washing and drying. I it sort of attached the zip ties for the various sets together, so that way I could help distinguish things a little bit once it dries, but I washed in cool tap water with a little bit of dish soap. You know, in all of these videos where I've tried glazing, I usually try glazing with a black. And then I just don't quite get the response I want. But here with the navy, on all of the bases, I got what feels like a thin layer. You feel like, I mean, the yarn is purplish, but you feel like you can look through that navy and see the pink. And that layer, like a glazed donut, is what I really, really have wanted. And so Mimi, thinking back to the times when I've accidentally received a gorgeous glaze, I don't know if any of the accidental ones have been with black. I think it's been with other colors. And so maybe that is the secret and something I need to uh, consider moving forward. But it's got a little bit of dish soap. So I'm thrilled with this. The one downside of this color is that it takes so long for a pot with so much water in it to cool. So. I don't know the best way to mitigate that. Uh, if I wanted to say, try to do more of this, which maybe I will for another video, try to dye a lot more of this um, because I really, really like it. I mean, I would happily make a sweater for myself in this color. I think it is amazing. So, interesting. There is minimal pink coming out. So I'm gonna go ahead and rinse this a couple more times and then put it through the spin dryer and hang it up to dry with the rest of the yarn. But I'm, this is a success. And I did it on purpose. 
here are the three main glazing attempts where we had one where we started cool and we had a little bit less dye, so we got a paler color overall. Two, we started with a warm dye bath and had a little bit more dye, and both of these had pre-soaked yarn. And then our final example, we had, we started warm but with dry yarn and the same amount of acid as this time. Looking at just the Muse, which is 100% superwash merino, a single ply. This was our first example, and I mean, look at some of this glaze. You can clearly see the white under layer of yarn beneath this gray, really shallow layer of color. You can also see it really well when we had the hot dye bath, a little more acid. It is a tiny bit more subtle. I think that the glaze isn't quite as dramatic in some places, but I think starting with pre-soaked yarn, and I would try starting cold again, uh, maybe even with more acid. I think that uh, something somewhere between the two, starting with pre-soaked yarn worked really well. What didn't work quite as well was when we used the same amount of dye in these two cases, but over here we added dry yarn. I think if I were going to take a strand of this dry, of this yarn that started off dry and open it up, you can see there is some uneven penetration there, but overall the color went a lot deeper here. I just fixed the color balance so you can see the depth and the hue in here. Some areas of this still feel glazed, but it is more dramatic here because you feel like you're looking through that gray color to the white beneath. So why is this the case? I think that the differences between these two are ultimately very subtle, but it does seem to me that instead of dry yarn acting like a resist so that way the color strikes faster on the outside, putting in dry yarn like a sponge into the dye bath soaked up some of that dye a little bit faster than the dye could absorb, giving more dye access to the center. Whereas if there was already some liquid in that yarn, the dye didn't immediately go in and replace that liquid that was already present. At least that's my hypothesis. And again, the differences here are really, really subtle. Uh, I definitely still think that we have something that you could call glazing here, uh, but to my eye, this one gives you more of a feel of what that under layer looked like. I think these same trends are true with the stroll, but since this has thinner plies and is a bit loftier overall, the dye has an easier time accessing the yarn and binding. But I do feel uh, like we have a bit more shallow penetration when we started with the pre-soaked yarn. I do absolutely feel like a glazing effect here. You can feel, if I open this up, you can see that we have uneven color penetration. It was striking to the outside. It's just really, really subtle. And I think if I had a color under here, this glaze could tone down the overall colorway, but it might be harder to see and feel than in the Muse base. With more dye and starting hot, I think I feel a similar thing, but the dye definitely did penetrate deeper. Uh, and so I still, parts of this I would look and be like, yeah, it feels glazed. I think it's hard to film and photograph grays and black. The final colorway doesn't, I would probably just call it a tonal. I wouldn't pull this yarn out of a dye pot and go, Ooh, that looks glazed if I was a surprise from a leave no dye behind in the way that I would these other two. But I do think it is the most obvious, I would say, here in the first one starting cold. The differences between these three is ultimately really, really subtle. But I do think I've learned so much from this deep dive, especially compared to the last time I did a deep dive. I got really lucky the first time I ever tried glazing because I used Hawthorne as the base, which is a higher twist yarn. But I knew that I wanted the colors to strike quick and shallow, and so I was trying to go with a really, really fast dip into the pot. But over time, realizing that if I have a condition where 
the die will strike overall a little bit slower. That means I can get more even coverage all over the skein. But I eventually, and especially through this video, have realized because from accidental results that having a high acid and large volume of water means that as soon as the dye molecule comes into contact with the yarn, it strikes really quickly. But overall, it takes more time for the dye to reach the yarn to begin with with more water, which allows us to get more coverage over the entire skein. Because some of the issues I was having was that the glaze would be extraordinarily tonal. And I didn't want it to be like perfect, even glaze, but I was like, how do I get this feel more even? And I think the large volume of water is the answer. Large volume of water, high acid. These are some of the best results I've ever had. So I took these lessons that we learned and a colorway that I know would break to see how we could do this. And bam, I am so unbelievably happy with how this turned out. I mean, this is incredible. It's a pink yarn and it has a super shallow navy pattern on top of it. On our Muse base, Superwash Merino Twist, and even our Swish DK. All three of these bases are 100% Superwash Merino, with our Swish DK being the loftiest, the least amount of twist that we have. And this absolutely feels glazed. It is awesome. And the coverage of the navy is also really, really good over all of these skeins. I think it worked the best on the Muse, this single ply yarn, but it still worked great on the other two bases. And the reason why I tried these three is because I got yarn that felt very, very glazed using a black and purple pop combination from the Summer Mini Skein mini series. And I was like, okay, this worked. Why did it work so well here and not always other times? And so I tried to use that information to help me create something with intent. And well, I, I guess I should say, I've already done this type of colorway, um, this navy and pink colorway. I've tweaked it a little bit. I've already tried it again. I wanna create this colorway for a sweater. That is a goal, but that is for another video. We did also have this yarn mop where we have, it's almost a pastel, ugh, it's a purple gray kind of color. There are elements in here that do feel really glazed. Um, it feels like that color is just on the outside, but given that the yarn is so pastel, I think that it's hard to see. And so if we had really saturated colors underneath it, that would therefore be really hard to see and to measure as well. So I think this yarn is beautiful and I think it does also help respond to a question where, can you glaze a bright color with a pastel? You can, it may not make a huge impact, but if you have say an, a neon orange yarn and you want it a little bit less bright, over dyeing it with a little bit of blue or a little bit of purple might not change it in a huge way, but could just tone down that brightness just a tiny bit. I would say this is at least my third deep dive into glazing yarn, especially if you consider things like uh, the Hanukkah special, and then the follow-up to that episode where I wanted to try to take another look into it. Uh, but I think each time I go and I do this and I try just changing the conditions a little bit, it really has helped me understand the technique. And therefore, I would say that sometimes the best way to master something, which don't get me wrong, I don't think I have this mastered, but the best way to master something is to try and try again if you don't succeed. But also, you can try and do these tests on mini skeins of yarn. And so breaking down these whole skeins into smaller samples and trying that can also be really, really helpful and beneficial. Um, so then you can help refine your technique. It's just some things do vary a little bit when you scale them up and use more yarn, but overall, I am just beyond thrilled. I am so happy with how this turned out today. 
it seems like I finally have a balance of letting the die strike really, really fast, but also slowing down the rate that the die can actually hit the yarn. So that way we can get more even coverage, but still a very shallow application of color. And I will be exploring this more, and so we'll see if I can do this uh, intentionally in the future. <laughs> Maybe even for a sweater? We'll see, but please make sure you're subscribed so that way you don't miss any of the journey. I still can't believe that we're at 300 episodes. When back when I started this, I originally kickstarted the first 25 episodes of Dye Pot Weekly, and here we are with 300 episodes and counting. Thank you all so much for supporting this series and the Chemnitz Tutorials YouTube channel in general. I really appreciate all of your support, comments, and suggestions, and look forward to more years of exploring yarn dyeing and creating fun videos. I started Dye Pot Weekly to help launch my exploration into commercial dyes. Before Dye Pot Weekly 1, I used mostly food coloring with some tulip tie-dye along the way, but still, I was mostly food coloring based. And I can see how much I've grown, both in confidence but also technique, over all of these videos. And I really, really appreciate you joining me on this journey, on this exploration, and I know there is still so much more that I can learn, so many more things I want to try, so many techniques like this one that I want to continue to refine, so that way I can get the effects I really want on yarn intentionally and not just accidentally. There are a few other milestones that we're hitting around now, and I think there will likely be a celebration dying live stream coming up not too long, so stay tuned for details on that. If you'd like to support the content here on the channel, subscribing is the biggest thing that you can do. But if you're looking for other ways, I do have an Etsy shop where most of the yarn dyed in my videos ends up, and I also have a Patreon. You can find links to both of these down in the video description. In the Etsy shop, there's also a listing where you can become a lab partner and get shoutouts in an episode of Dye Pot Weekly, and that's a lot of fun too and worth checking out. These last hundred episodes really did fly by, and I am still amazed that this is episode number 300. Oh man, I cannot wait to see what I will create next. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and I look forward to all of the beautiful colors we will create together. Thank you so much for watching.